everyone. I'm sorry for the delay. We are having some technical problems. Um, unfortunately, we are not be able to see the slides now, but we are, we are going to fix it. Uh, I'm going to just tell some information and the lecture is going to start. Okay. So welcome everyone to the Brazilian IT Summer School. I'm very happy to have you all here after the pandemic. Unfortunately, last year we had an online version, and that was sad because I think everyone likes to come to Campinas and have a good time in these two weeks. I, I also said. Okay. So I will start th uh, by thanking uh, SBC, the Brazilian Computer Society, uh, which uh, promotes the, uh, the event. Also, Unicamp and the Compute, uh, Institute of Computing, which uh, organize and give you space for this to happen. And for uh, I also would like to thank our sponsors. So as gold sponsors this year, we have Vitec, Stone, and Motorola and Eldorado. As a silver sponsor, we have Rei do Pitaco. And as bronze sponsor, we have Alura, Profusion, and Consulting. So I, I really would like to thank them because the event couldn't happen without them. I also like to thank that uh, we have this Woman in ICPC program, and some of the sponsors uh, decided to collaborate with this. So they paid for some to, uh, some female students to come to school. So Vitex, Stone, Motorola, and Eldorado paid for uh, one female student to come for the school. Pedro Pitac paid by, uh, to five students, female students, and Alura and Via Consulting paid for two students. Uh, so I have a nice graph here that you can see. <laughs> but our participation was uh, was increasing. In the first, we were a small school, only for some work finalists, and then we begin to grow. It recently, uh, in 2019, we started a second class, the Brazilian final class, and now we have today 25 work finalists here, and also uh, in total, we have uh, 191 students in this edition. Uh, there's also a nice map that you can see. <laughs> but uh, after that, I'm going to share this, this, this image with you because it's really nice. Uh, we have people from all around Brazil, but we also have some people from Argentina. The Argentinian guys can raise his hand. Okay. Uh, some people from Chile, okay, in the back and here, uh, Colombia, there, Mexico, no, or oh, maybe they did arrive, and Peru, also no, okay. Um, and we also uh, have increased our female participation, which is very important for us. Uh, just for you to know, in uh, 2019, we had only eight uh, female students participating in the school. Uh, in 2020, we decided to fund uh, students to come for school, female students to come for the school. We had 15 uh, stu female students funded by the school and another 13 that came by themselves. In uh, 2022, we had the online version, so there was no funded female students because there was uh, only like a uh, free registration fee. It was not uh, on site. Yeah. So we had 23 female students. In these years, we have incredible numbers. We were we, uh, able to pay to 29 female students to come for school, and we also have another 40, uh, 14 uh, that came paying by themselves. Uh, 
So as instructors, this year, this year we have Bartos. I don't know if that's how I can pronounce it. Uh, he's an international grandmaster on code force. In the last six years, his students won five gold, one silver, and one bronze medal in IOI. And he's a member. Uh, he was a member of the IOI host scientific committee in 2019. And next week we have Jonathan Irving Gunnar. Uh, he was bronze and silver medals in IOI uh, 2012, in IOI 2013, in ICPC 2014, and in ICPC 2015. He is member of the IOI uh, International Institute Committee, and he was chair of the host committee of IOI 2022. So, what is the schedule for you? Let me draw this. Okay. So, you are going to wake up. Then from 8.30 to 11.30, you're going to have a lecture. Okay? Then, if you have your badge, you're going to have lunch. in the university restaurant. If not, you're going to skip directly to the contest. <laughs> okay? Then, if you have your badge, you're going to have dinner, And you can sleep. <laughs> then you get again and do all over, all over. Okay? If you want, maybe you can do some up so in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that's optional. This is the schedule for every day except Thursday when is the sponsor day, and Sunday when we don't have an activity. Um, so let me talk about sponsor day and pizza day. So this Thursday we are going to have some activities. At 10 p.m. we are going to have a talk by Heido Pitaco. It's not going to be on this building. It's going to be in another building where everyone can fit. And at, uh, then we are going to have lunch at the university restaurant. And then at uh, 1.30 p.m. we are going to have an activity by Motora Motorola Eldorado. Half is, go uh, is going to be here and half is going to be on Instituto Eldorado, which is nearby, and we are going to walk there. On Saturday, we are going to have pizza in Bosque do Ice, the I see wood, which is in the back of the building, uh, starting at 6 p.m. And some of our sponsors are going to be here to talk to you and interact and so on. And the other Thursday, uh, we are going to have activities in that other building that I mentioned uh, by stone at 9.30. And then afterwards, we're going, uh, we are going to have lunch and then two and I have PM, we are going to have an activity by Vitex. And afterward, Vitex is going to bring everyone here for a cocktail. And by cocktail, I don't mean alcohol, I mean, I mean like salgadinhos and stuff like that. Okay, so just to end, I would like again to thank our sponsors, our instructors, which is uh, very kind to offer the, their time to teach you. Uh, Unicamp, SBC, the other organizers that are so
so much helpful, like Lucy, Leilton, Sandra, uh, Anido, Carlinhos, and so on. And all the monitors, uh, the staff that's helping us uh, serving the coffee break and so on. Okay, let me just uh, pass the word to Carlinhos first. Yeah, and then we can start the lecture. <laughs> Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, it's re really nice, it's very nice to have you here again after two years, yeah? Two years of online, no, only, only one year of online. Yeah, it's just very nice to have you here. I hope to see most of you in March again. Yeah? How many of you are going to be in, in Campo Grande? Ah, very nice. The South American, the other South American guys are going to the original, probably. Yeah. And then all no, no, this year we have some some news in 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 uh, Latin America. In uh, this next uh, regional, we are going to probably we are going to have a Latin American uh, final in Mexico in next year in 2024. In March, it will be very nice. No? We have uh, another step to the World Finals. Yeah, it's so uh, we have very good news for you. Okay, enjoy the week. I think you have you're going to to learn a lot to Bartos and then the other Indonesian guy. Yeah, Indonesian. Yeah, yeah. And so have fun. And welcome again. Okay. So the floor is yours. Okay. Maybe you that Do they need to move the camera? So let me start with one. Uh, can everyone hear me? I hope so. Uh, my name is Bartosz. Uh, I'm originally from Poland, but I currently live in Canada, in the beautiful city of Waterloo, Ontario. Um, this is my second time in Brazil, actually, so I'm really looking forward to spend uh, more time here. Um, as uh, it was already said, like I'm mostly involved in IOI stuff, but I also spend some time on teaching people, especially in Poland, for the ICPC competitions. Uh, right now, I also work on the coding competitions at Google. You probably heard about CodeGem and Kickstart, so this is something that my team is actually doing. Uh, and I'm also still involved in some competitions in Poland. I'm currently a, a vice chair of the uh, organize, organizational committee in the Polish Junior Olympiad Informatics. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, mostly everything about me. Uh, some things about this week and overall uh, camp in general. So, first of all, uh, the most important thing that you need to do today is to register for the online judge. We'll be using CATIS for the first week, and the second week will be public of forces, but we have some problems with that, especially we noticed that we solve a lot of problems. And we might have some issues with that. But for the first week, uh, please go to open.patis.com slash register. And please register before the first contest today. So before 1 p.m. today. Uh, and if you can, please use the email address that you use on the form that we sent you asking about, like the survey that we sent you like a month ago or something. That would be like very easy for us to take these emails and then put them in the chat. Otherwise, it might be slightly easy. So, please use uh, we'll be using mostly existing contests that were already passed. Like I spent, I don't know how many hours to find contests that I hope none of you have seen before. 
Uh, I hope that's the case, but we'll see. Um, some other things. Uh, so the contest will be on practice. I talked about this one. Uh, about lectures. So the lectures, uh, except for today, will be starting with the uh, like editorial session of the previous contest. So we'll be talking about all of the problems from the previous day. Uh, I want it to be quite interactive, so maybe in some cases if you might be interested in talking about some problem, uh, I'm very open to hearing about it. Um, and after that we'll have a short lecture about some other things. So we divided this camp into two weeks, uh, as you already know. The first one will be, I think, a little bit math heavy. So we'll be talking about a lot of mathematical stuff because this is something that you wanted to hear about uh, based on the survey. The second one is mostly data structures heavy, I would say. So it will be like a split between these two things. Um, and also, I will be mostly focusing on independence contest. So the topics of the lectures will not be 101 to the uh, contest, and will be different on the second week. So the second week, the lectures will be much more... Uh, the topics of the lectures will be something that you can use in the contest more. I would say that. So we also have like this split of different situations, and I hope you will like enjoy it, because this is something that you want. You want to like first use some of the new things that you learned in the, in the uh, problems that probably involve this uh, method, so data structures, and you also wanted to basically solve some problems, so this is why I'm here. Um, of absorbing, it is technically optional, but I strongly advise you to at least try to spend some time after the contest to talk with your friends, talk with people around you, maybe there's something that you missed. So you can prepare for the lecture next next day to maybe have some other ideas. Maybe you can try to absolve the, some of these problems. Uh, okay, I think that's mostly everything what I wanted to say. Maybe one last thing that might be important. Uh, if you want to be absolutely that would be the best way to write me an email. My email address is my last name of my first name and gmail.com. Uh, but in general, if you want to talk about something, I should be available during the coffee break, so maybe during lunch, then just come and say hi, and then maybe you can talk about this. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay, awesome. Uh, one last thing, uh, if you have any questions during the lecture, please raise your hand and interrupt me in any way. I really like when the lecture is interactive, so basically when we can talk, it's not like just my monologue about something. I will be asking you a lot of questions, because this is also something that I enjoy. Uh, if you know something that's shout, or maybe raise your hand or something like that. And it doesn't have to be correct <laughs> every time. So if you even have like a slight idea what might be the answer, just say it. Um, Okay, so I think that's, your, that's everything. Please remember to do it before 1 p.m. because it's very important. And my boss said that I should wake up. Uh, okay. Awesome, so let's start with the lecture today. Uh, we'll start with talking about some maybe slightly easier topic than usual, but I find it very interesting and also has a lot of applications and a lot of algorithms behind it. So we'll be talking about permutations. So first of all, let's start by saying what is a permutation. So many of you probably have some idea of a rough definition, but I will just say that uh, for this class, we'll say that we'll start with some set S, and then the permutation of this set is some arrangement of this element. Maybe just to give some example, because like it's very as a heavy map definition. So in most uh, examples of this class, we'll be talking about the set of integers, and we're talking about the set of one to n. So the example of n will be equal to five, set one to be equal to five. And then permutation is basically putting these numbers in some order. So for example, like 5, 2, 1, 3, 4. So permutation, 3, 1, 5, 2, 4 is permutation. 
But it's like one, two, three, four. It's not a permutation because we are missing one element five. And one, one, two, three, four. It is also not a permutation because we have the same element five. And things like one, one, two, three, four, five. It's also not a permutation because we still have the same element five. So you can think that we need to have two things. We need to have every element. So it has to exist somewhere in this permutation, uh, and it has to exist only once. Okay? If you want another map definition, we can say that permutation of set S is a B action. So what is a B action? If you remember, it is something that is um, in the action and the loop action. So like, it, you don't have to know about this, but I just want to say it, because it is a function under the hood. So injection is something that is like for every, for, for different inputs, we are getting different outputs. And subjection is that for every, if, for every output, Output, there is an input. So basically, if you think about it in the function terms, we have one, two, three, four, and we have one, two, three, four. We have some arrows between these two sets. And we need to make sure that for every output, we have at least one uh, arrow pointing to this output. And we also want to make sure that for every input, uh, we have different outputs. So we cannot say that for both of them, the output will be more than three. Uh, I said it's not really enough. Oh, uh, the other way. So for four, we cannot have four point two it and three point two. So we cannot have this situation. Three, four, and then four, three. So this is not allowed. The other one I say, it, it won't be on the back. So it doesn't work very well. Okay? Uh, so this is like something that is nice to know, but not very important. Uh, how we usually represent permutations? This is something that uh, we use by function. So that's different ways. So first of all, is basically putting these numbers in the order. So this is basically saying that this is the presentation. So this is the array of uh, some elements of the set that I that I will determine by just saying like which one is after which one. Uh, in some things we use something called two line notations, and in this case we basically say that the first element is equal to one. The second element is equal to three. The third element is equal to four. The fourth element is equal to five, and the fifth element is equal to two. Okay, so this is like another way to use permutation, and it should be useful in some applications like this. I'm saying this right now. Uh, another thing is basically we said that it's a function, so we can say, for example, that if p from i is equal to n minus i plus 1. So this is another way to define some permutation. So for example, if we use this uh, p on set s, which is equal to 1, 2, 3, then what would be the permutation p on this set? <coughs> yeah, it's just, it is just reversing the model uh, of these elements. Okay, so usually we'll use uh, lowercase Greek letters to represent uh, permutations, but it's not like something that is very important. Um, okay, so another way to represent permutations is just any graph. So everything is connected in some way, so we also try to put some graph here in permutations as well. So when we have a graph, so let's talk about this one. So we will have some elements of the set, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then we want to do arrows in a way that from 
element 1 to the advance to 1, so we have a loop here. From element 2 we are going to 3. From 3 we are going to 4. From 4 we are going to 5. And from 5 we are going to 2. Okay? All of these graphs that are based on permutations are very specific. Can someone see like what is important about them? Only cycles. Only cycles, yes. Because you can see that every time, uh, first of all, we need to move in some direction. Because like we always have one arrow going out of the node and one arrow going into the node. Okay, so we take that the into the green is equal to one, and the out degree is also equal to one. So we quickly see that it has to be always some set of cycles. You cannot do, have anything else. Because if we even have something like, something like this, then we cannot say that the input will be equal to one. So it cannot be like any tree, and it's three connected to a cycle. It has to be only cycles. Okay? And it is quite important. So all permutations graph graphs are collections of cycles. And maybe I should say that they are simple cycles. So you cannot have something like this. And these are still cycles, but they are not simple, so you cannot have anything like that. Okay? Uh, okay, so maybe quick question. Uh, are there any limits of the number of cycles in this graph? So what is the maximum or minimum number of cycles? So n is maximum, and how we can achieve that? So this is one example where we have n equal to 4, and we have 4 cycles. Uh, can we get only one cycle? Yes. How? Uh, if like 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and so on. Yes, so something like that. If we think about it, like in our dog voltage, it will be something like a, a cyclic rotation of this rotation. So something like that. Okay? Awesome. So this is general things about permutations and permutation. Uh, there are some very specific permutations that we want to talk about right now. So first one, it is called... Transposition. or most commonly, I think they, people call it swap. So what is a swap? A swap is a permutation that consists only of one cycle of length two. Okay, so for example, I can have something like this. Five, four, six, seven. So this is my permutation. And when I think about it in the graph world, Has something like this. So every other cycle is of length one, and then you have one cycle that has length two. Uh, why, is, why is that important? Can anyone think about it? Yes, so when we think about it, uh, every permutation is some combination of some number of swaps or uh, transpositions. So when you think about it in a different way, so for example, if we have a long table and you want to put, I don't know, like some flowers on the table, uh, I don't know the flowers. And then our goal is to put them in the increasing order of the heights. So what we can do is basically we want we can introduce swaps. So we are taking two flowers, we have two hands, so we are taking two flowers, and then you swap and we swap the for example we just swap this one with this one. And then we want to say that in the end we can get every single permutation. 
So every single arrangement of, this, of these routes. Okay? So what is important here, once again, is every permutation can be achieved in some sequence of blocks. Okay? And try to remember the sequence of numbers. Like this, uh, that we'll talk about it like more formally in a moment because we need to introduce like how we can put two permutations together or how we can compose them. But this is something that is probably like very easy to see right now. I hope so. Any questions at this point? Okay. So the other one I want to talk about is called involved. So involution is a function that is, uh, let's say, f of f of x is equal to x. So when we apply, uh, when we apply the function f two times to the same argument, we get this argument back, and this is for all x. Okay. Example of such involution, for example, is like the f of x is equal to minus x for the set of let's say real numbers. And maybe f x is equal to 1 divided by x for the real numbers without 0. So these are normal functions that are involutions. So now let's think about permutations that are involutions. What we can say about them? They have a bunch of cycles of length 2, right? Say it again, I'm sorry? Uh, you have a bunch of cycles of length 2. Yes, but only. Or one. No, you can also have. Yes, that what is important here is basically we want to have something that is coming back to the same element when we apply this permutation twice. So what we can have is only either the self loops of the cycles of length one, of the loops uh, of the of the cycles of of length two, so something like this. So you can say that every involution consists of cycles of length one of two. And that's it. Okay? So do we feel want us to talk a little bit more about it? Because this is this was just an introduction. Any questions? Uh, okay, now let's talk a bit uh, what happens when we apply a swap on a permutation. <laughs> so we'll start with some permutation. I will just come down from one. Let's have something like this. And I will try to have a visual presentation to this as well. So we have 3 going to 3, 3 going to 4, so 2 going to 2. Five, and then set six and seven, like this. Okay, so now, you, now when we want to apply a swap to this permutation, what we are doing is we are choosing two elements, and we are swapping them, so something like this. Okay, so now let's think a bit what will happen to the visual representation, so what will happen to the graph. So in this case, that was the original permutation, and we swap these two elements. So this stays the same. I want to use a different color if I have some. <coughs> so we have one. This has changed a bit. So from two, we are going to three. From three, we are going to four. From four, we are going to five. And from 5 we are going to 2. So we have one cycle of length 4, and this didn't change at all. Okay? So what we see is basically we have taken these two cycles and merged them together. Now the question is what will happen if we we'll do it again, maybe with this cycle and this cycle. So we take one element of this cycle, let's say we have an table with numbers from 1 to 5, from 2 to 5. Let's take 3, 
and let's take 6 and let's swap them. So we are swapping 3 with 6 and we are swapping 6 with 3. And what will happen now? Uh, let's try to do it here. So after the second swap, we have 1 going to 1. Then we have 2 going to 6, 6 going to 7, 7 going to 3, 3 going to 4, 4 going to 5, and finally 5 going to 2. So it happened again. We took two elements from different cycles, swapped them, and what happened is basically merging the two, set, the two cycles together. So we had cycle of length 4 and cycle of length 2, and we basically match them together into one cycle of length 6. Okay? Uh, something that I've been telling here is basically we swap these two elements, so 3 with 6. So what happened is we from 2 we went exactly uh, directly to 6, then 7, and then we came back to 3. Okay? So basically, uh, like from the previous element of the cycle before 3, we went to the first element of the cycle, and then we went back to the next element of the cycle again. So it's not like, I probably didn't explain it properly, but what you need to remember is we are merging two cycles together into one longer cycle. Okay, so now what happens if we do the opposite? So we are taking two elements from the same cycle, and then we are swapping them. And again, we will split the cycle, yes. So let's say we use this example again, and let's, with, let's swap two elements from this side. So maybe I'll swap four with six. Okay, so after the third swap, we get one, then we have two going to four, four going to five, uh, 5 going to 2, and then we have 3 going to 6, 6 going to 7, and 7 going to 3. Okay, so it happened exactly after one guess. We split this into two, uh, two cycles. And you can even see because we swapped 6 and 4, what happened is that uh, we have 2 for 5, so we have this cycle. Uh, This is one cycle, and this is the other cycle. Because what we did, more or less, is basically cut them here. Because we swap 6 and 4. Okay? So if you want to know the length of the uh, cycles that we'll get, it's basically cutting them at each one. So the first one will become 4 up to the point that we need 6, and the other one will become 6 up to the point that we need 4. So we know a way to use swaps to either match or split cycles. Now we want to use it in some problems. So during this lecture, we'll be talking about some problems from old competitions. I probably won't give you an online judge to try, but I will give you a link to the online judge when you can try these problems. And not all of them. Some of them I either came up myself, or they don't even like exist anyway, so I cannot give them. Uh, this one I think I can find. And uh, the problem is called Swaps. So we want to introduce a metric. And the metric will be okay, maybe first of all. We want to say what is an identity permutation. So identity permutation of some set of integers from 1 to n will be exactly this exactly this element in the subject process. So we can think about it in this way. So just a bunch of cells. Okay? This is our identity permutation. And this is something similar to being one and multiplication. We'll talk about it in detail later, but you can think about like being a neutral element of permutation. 
I have to say, I'm not used to talking so loud in a bus, so I do apologize in advance. Uh, but I'll try my best. Uh, okay, and then we want to introduce some metrics. And if you want to have metric D on some permutation P, which is the number of swaps, minimal number of swaps, we need to perform to get to identity permutation. Or maybe even different, uh, this is equivalent of saying what is the minimal number of swaps we need to do to solve the permutation. Because identity is basically solving these uh, elements in the, in the increasing order. Okay? So, for example, the best D from this, let's call it epsilon, from epsilon to zero, because we don't need to do any swaps. But, for example, when we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 6, 8, let's call it alpha. So D of alpha is equal to 1, because we need to do one swap here. Okay? And the problem is, uh, we are giving some permutation of some length. So the input is input. Some permutation, so for example, 3, 5, 2, 4, 1. And then we also have another variable, which is something that we, let's call it k. This is the desired uh, value of D from this permutation. So now our goal is to find the permutation, find a permutation, uh, such that D, uh, let's call it beta, D from beta is equal to K. And what we are allowed to do is we are allowed to do swaps on this initial permutation. So we are starting from this. We can perform some number of swaps. And then we want to get some permutation that has the distance in this metric that we determine equal to some number k that is given to us. Okay? Uh, do you need a full example, or is it enough to understand the problem? Okay. okay, so this is the problem that is from actual competition. Now I'm listening to some ideas. You need to speak louder or can you take another microphone? Can you speak louder? Okay, that is almost correct. Okay, so I will repeat that. So the idea was that we start with this permutation, and then we want to end this with permutation that has k cycles. Yeah, I'm repeating that. That is almost correct. So, for example, if we look here at the identity permutations, then we have n cycles, but the metric is zero. So it doesn't work in this case, but it's like very close. It's n minus the number of cycles. Yes. So this metric <laughs> is the number of elements, so let's call it n, minus the number of cycles. Question. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand fully the problem. And do, do we want to like minimize the number of stops? Want to do Not yet. I'm just calling like n number of stops. So we want to like print the swaps. So what's the my question is like what uh, what does the initial permutation matter in the input? And because we want to start from this and then we want we want to get to some permutation, like we apply the swaps on the initial permutation. Okay, so we want to like print out the swaps that we want to do. Yes, something like that. Okay. I, okay. I specifically didn't mention some parts. We need to minimize the number of swaps. And even there's like I think another requirement that we need to 
between the minimal, like, minimal lexicological answer, but it is not very important, so I basically skip these parts. Okay, but this is something that is very important, because this artificial metric that I introduced, basically the distance from the uh, identity presentation, is basically saying how many cycles we have, okay, n minus how many cycles we have. And why is that? Because we said like uh, five or ten minutes ago that what we are doing with, cycle, with swaps is either increasing the number of cycles or decreasing the number of cycles. So what we can do with one uh, swap is basically change the number of cycles by one either up or down. So when you want to go to a presentation that has exactly n cycles, in each step, so first of all, you need to calculate how many cycles this presentation has. So for example, it has some L cycles. And then you want to go to K cycles. So you have two options, uh, three basically. And I probably should use this part of my bond. So the first one, L is equal to K, then we are done, we don't have to do anything. The second one, L is smaller than K, so what we need to do, we need to increase the number of cycles. So what we need to do? Yeah, so we need to somehow get the uh, division into cycles, and then we need to split the cycles that we already have. So what we need to do here, split the cycles, by selecting some two elements of the cycle. And the first one is L is greater than K, so we need to do the opposite, so merge some cycles by selecting two elements Okay? And we can even say what is the minimal number of swaps that we need to do. Yeah. So the minimal will be L minus K, the absolute value of that. Uh, and that is that the last part of the problem is what will be the minimal lexicographically answer. So what is the minimal lexicographical a set of swaps that we need to do, but I will leave it as an exercise because it's not very interesting. Okay? So we did that problem, and that was very quick. But we needed to, like, first dive into the permutations. I have a question. Yes. In the original problem, n was 10 to the 5? I think so. Oh, this is actually one thing that maybe we should discuss. So, given the permutations, what is the linear way of dividing this permutation into, into the set of cycles? You see uh, for every number where it's in this is that, right? Yes, but there was like another answer that someone said DFS, and this is yeah. probably a better answer. Because what we are doing is basically we start from some number, so for example, I need to, let's look at this example. So we start from one. Then we are looking at another screen. So we are looking at screen. We are marking this as visited. Then we are going to two. We are marking two as visited. We are going to five. We are marking five as visited, and so on and so on. So maybe I will just say it out loud for that one to see. How to get five. Uh, I need some presentation. Okay. So once again, we are starting from one. Then we are looking at the next remark. This as the set. We are going to element two. We are going to element three. Then we are looking at 3, it goes to 5. We are looking at 5, it goes to 1. And we are marking all of them as visited. Then we are going to the next element that is not visited, which is 4. And then we run DFS from this uh, node. So 
So this row is back to four, nothing gets here. Then we are going to the next unvisited node. Five is visited, so we're going to six. This doesn't look like six. And six goes to seven, seven goes back to six, and then we are done. Okay? So what we are doing for e from one to n, if not visited i, then use DFS of i, and DFS is basically marking this unvisited, and then DFS from, let's say, term i, and then we need to make sure that it finished sometime, so some, in some way, so maybe if visited i is already to do, then just need to do that. Okay, so when we are going back to the same element that is already visited, then you can just cut the uh, recursion here. Any questions? Do, does everyone see that this is linear in time? How about memory? It has to be linear as well because we need to keep this array. And also tell you we want to keep the cycle somewhere. So we also like if we want we can have like some vector C and then we can put back elements here. So we can have this representation here. Uh, okay. Uh, can I have a quick show of hands? Do you want to have two blades or one longer blade? Who wants two blades? Raise your hand. One longer blade. Okay, one longer blade one, so <laughs> we are having one longer blade. Uh, okay. Any questions? Or can we move from? Yes, so at the end of like so I'll be doing the uh, contest, I will send you all the link to all of them. Like the list of links to all of them. Okay. what we can do with composing two permutations or even more permutations. So what is composing two permutations? So do you know that's what, what is composing two functions? So when we have one function f and the other function g, we can compose these two functions to basically have another function h equal to f with g. Basically we are first applying I, I, to be honest, I don't remember that, was, that way of the other way. But I hope that's correct. <laughs> I really hope that's correct. So first we are applying B, and then we are applying F to the level of the function of B. Okay? So we can do the exact same thing with permutations because they are functions. So we can have one permutation alpha, and the other permutation beta. And then we want to know what will happen if we apply, maybe when we first apply the alpha, and then we apply that one. Okay? So this will be a different permutation, but it might be probably very easy to see because all of them are reactions, then it will be the same, uh, like the permutation of the same set. Okay? So let's try to do it. And this is when the two lines notation is very helpful. Because what we can do, we are basically saying first we want to apply A. So this is A, uh, uh, alpha, and this is beta. One, four, one, three, four, four. And then alpha, uh, beta, 
uh, composed with alpha will, will be 1, 2, 3, 4. Then we apply alpha, so this is 2, 3, 1, 4. And then we apply beta, which is basically taking away. So 2 will have 3, so 3 will have 4, and so 4 will have uh, 2, and so 1 will have 1. Okay? So then the final permutation beta uh, composed with alpha is 3, 4, 1, 2. Okay? So if you are looking at this in a different way, so for example, we want to know what will be the beta composed with alpha from 2. We are first applying alpha to 2, so it will give us 3. So the beta from 3, then we will get beta, and then we will get 4. So we see that the second element of beta composed with alpha is 4. Okay? So this is composition. Now, uh, what will happen if I try to compose the function, the permutation with itself? So what will happen if I take this alpha, and then I want to think what will, what will be alpha composed with alpha? So I can probably do it in the same way as here. So let's try to do it first. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4. Then I'm using alpha, so I'll have 2, 3, 1, 4. And then I'm using alpha again, I will have uh, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1, 1 goes to 2, and 4 goes to 4. Okay? Do we see something specific about this? Yes. So let me try to put this in a graph. So this is alpha. And now I want to see what is the alpha composed with alpha, or you can I can say this alpha squared. So this will be one going to three, three going to two, two going to one. And then all this do the same. So what we did basically is we, what we are doing is saying that we are uh, traveling two arrows at one time. So from one we went to three, from three we went to two, and from two we went to one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what will happen if I do it again? So what will happen if I try to compose a squared with a, uh, with alpha squared with alpha? Mm -hmm. Yes, so now we are traveling three arrows at the same time. So from one we went back, we will go back to one, from two we will go back to two, and from three we will go back to three. So we have exactly something like this. And we can even go here and just to verify that this is correct. So three will go to one, one will go to two, two will go to three, and four will go to four. So we are back at identity. Now, the question is, if I take any permutation, and I do it over and over, so composing this permutation with itself, will I, will I always go back to the identity permutation? Yes. 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 Uh, so the answer is yes. The question is, how many times we need to do that? And it is related, as someone already said, to the size of the cycles. Any ideas? Yep. So what we need to do when we have something like this? Okay. So let's say that all of this is one permutation. So what we need to do? We need to make sure that from this element we are going back to the same element, and we are doing this once every time we go, we go over the length of the cycle. So this is 5, this is 3, and this is 2. And we, we need to do for each cycle. So what we need to do is basically to calculate the uh, lowest common multiplier of 2, 3, and 5. And then we know that after 30 times, this element will be back here, this element will be back here, and this element will be back here. Is that correct? I think that's correct. I hope that's correct. Uh, Okay, yeah, that's awesome. Maybe I show other example that is not that trivial. So, for example, when we have one cycle of length 2 
and one cycle of length four. Then we are saying that this will go back after two uh, usages of the arrows, and this is going back after four. So then after four, everything will go back to the same place. I don't understand why the LTM, because aren't they in the independent problems? So um, one shouldn't um, be exactly the other? That's, uh, okay, that not, like this is one presentation. So for example, this is one, two, three, this is five, six, seven, eight, four, and this is nine, ten. So for example, let's just take a look what will happen after ten, uh, like, let's call it P. So let's see what will happen after we take P to the tenth power. So this, we will use ten hours. So we are going one, two, three, four, five, we are going to, uh, to three. Okay? So then p to the power of 10 from 1 is equal to 1. And then similarly, we are going here, just to, I want to continue this example. So p to the power of uh, 10 of 9, then it's using 10 arrows, so we are going back 1, 2, 3, 4, we are going back to 9. Okay? So we need to make sure that for every cycle that we have, that because we have a set of different cycles, we want to go to the same value again. So this is why we need to take the multiplier of this. And we are taking the lowest common multiplier because like when we just multiply the samples, like in this case, we might go over. We don't need eight to go to, we just need four. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, and there is a name for this. Uh, I, I just want to say that if that we want to do that, okay. Uh, this number, like the minimal number, uh, minimal power that you need to uh, compose the seminal permutation to get the identity, is called order of the permutation. Awesome. Uh, Uh, <laughs> because if you just keep going and you end up in the template, you just end up. Uh, yes, uh, I actually wanted to collect the data. So that's the very good one. So this is this, what will happen if you do it again? You will end up in the same place. Wait, what? No. I think it is okay. So this was free, so this was correct. So when you do it, a to the power of four will reverse this. Yes. No, I think that was right. Like when we use three arrows, we are getting back to the same place. But when we go one more, we are getting back the same presentation. So basically, in this case, alpha to the power of three is identity. So when we get alpha to the power of four, we get identity composed with alpha, which is alpha again. I wanted to say something else here, but I forgot. Uh, oh, I know. Uh, what's, so we know how to compose this. So now, another problem from the actual composition. What, uh, what will be the square root of the presentation? Okay, so now I will start with some Okay, now what we want to do for this, like it's not formal in any way, but I will just say, like this is the notation that we'll be using. So we are giving permutation B, the beta. I'm not very good at the number of the permutation today. And we want to find some permutation alpha, such that alpha to the power of 2, so alpha composed of alpha, is equal to beta. Okay? Uh, and let's also give you some limits. The length of the permutation, the beta, is quite fast. Okay? Any questions about the problem statement? So we are giving some permutation, 
you need to find the permutation that composed with itself will give this permutation on the input. So someone said uh, that the order has to be even, and I'm not so sure. Every cycle has to be odd. Uh, say it again. Every cycle should be odd to exist. Um, uh, kind of. So I'll give you like two or three minutes to think about because it's not something that you can describe. Like try to maybe write something down, maybe try to do something that like think about it in a way. Like you have all of the pieces, but I want you to connect them. So I'll give you like all of them, you like two two minutes to think about it, and then we'll come back and talk about the solution. <sighs> Okay, two minutes has passed, it has passed, so any ideas, of course. Okay, so first of all, a uh, very good thing to notice is that we need to think about even and all of cycle separately. So you said something that even cycles have to appear an even number of times. Each, each even length has to appear yes. an even number of times. So what we are saying that uh, when we have something like this, and like this, So we need to find a matching between uh, uh, cycles of even length we need, because we need to smash them together. Like, uh, that's not the best way to say it. Um, why? Because when we call translation and we do it square, all both cycles will have an even and even cycles turn into two even cycles, two, two cycles of the power of Exactly. So let me try to say it again. So in case of even cycles, 
when you want to uh, make, the, make, the, make this percentages powerful, we are having two separate cycles. We are having this cycle. So, this is one cycle. Because we are, what we are doing, we are basically skipping one, one habit. So this would be one cycle, and the other one would be the remaining one. I would just like to do the test So what we know is basically uh, there has to be enough even length uh, cycles to test them in a way that we can mark them, like we can have the one cycle out of them. So for these two, we will get one cycle of length A, and for these two, we will get one cycle of length 4. Okay? Uh, and it like, doesn't matter how we combine them, but there's a way to combine them in uh, some way. So this is for even cycles. How about odd cycles? So odd cycles are even easier than that. So let's take a look at some examples. One, two, three, four, five, and then back to one. So what is happening? From one we are going to Three, from 3 we are going to 5, from 5 we are going to 2, from 2 we are going to 4, and from 4 we are going to 1. So what is happening, we are getting another cycles of the same length, but with just the uh, nodes, uh, and the distance between these nodes is 2 in the, matter, in the metric of these arrows. So for 1 we are going to 3, then to 5, then to 2, and then to fall. Okay? So we are basically going by to like in this uh, cycle. Okay? So every of cycle corresponds to some other of cycle of the same length. But for every odd, we need to find the pair of the same length, and then we need to combine them into a cycle of uh, length of two times the cycle these two cycles length. Okay? And that's it, that's the whole problem. Any questions? Is it clear how to get this back? Like, because we are we are getting this, and we want to go back to this. Is it clear how to get this out there? Okay, I'll just say it. Uh, we basically need to reverse and just go by two or something like that. That's like very simple. Why can we always match up the even cycles? No, it's not always possible. Right? It is not the case that every permutation has a square root. Uh, the answer is impossible, it's also possible. But if there is a square root, it has to fulfill this uh, pairing or something like that. You can only pair and cycles on the side. Yes, yes, yes. I'm saying, like, uh, we need to make sure that we have the uh, same length here. So we cannot like, compose, uh, match together one cycle with length 2 and one cycle with length 4. They have to have exact pairing. Okay. Uh, so I have okay, one more law and then we'll have a day. So what we are doing actually with the composing of some elements, of some permutations, we are saying like, uh, what would be the element in something like this? So how many, like if we use arrows 150 times, what would be the element after basically using this arrow this many times? So we can do it quickly because we have this uh, uh, visualization of rotation of the graph here. So the question right now, can we expand it to a different kind of graph? So if you know there's some other graph called functional graphs that can have, that can have some uh, trees connected to the cycle. So we have something like this. This is called functional graph. But the question is, can we somehow expand this node? So like, if I start from some node, what would be the node after traveling through 150 arrows? Yes. Okay. So first of all, we always 
travels in direction of the cycle. So if we keep going to infinity, we'll always end up on the cycle. So what we can do, we can either go to the cycle linearly, or we can be even faster and do some kind of keep on the so final elliptic to do it in a logarithmic way. So we keep what will be the uh, what will be the node after one uh, arrow, what will be the node after two arrows, what will be the node after four hours, and so on and so on for all powers of two. And then we can logarithmically like keep the position that you want to be in. And after we are in the cycle, we are basically doing the same. So we know what is the length of the cycle because we can compute it. So we are just taking this, uh, like we are taking modulo of the length of the cycle. And then we know where exactly we will end up. So we will end in. Okay? So this is just, I just want to say that we are using very similar, but different similar methods for a different class of graphs. But still we are doing exactly the same. Okay, uh, let's have a break here for 15 minutes. And then we'll talk about inventions and about some very fancy theorem that is sometimes very important. <laughs>
Qual que é o nosso time? Gira aí, nosso time é o nosso time. Não vai girar, você tem que apertar o botão. Qual? Sim, não? É, é. Conseguiu? Conseguiu? Virou. É o Arthur Ah, eu tenho uma pergunta. Esse tempo daí é quanto tempo que falta? Sobra ou já passou? Prazer, prazer. Falta dois minutos. Tô demorando pra passar. Ah, ok. É, tipo, não tá escrito. Prazer. 
E aí ele vai pegar essa função plugar no código do juiz e você não tem que ligar. E aí você tinha que ser lá, Aqui, o meu documentação do censura. Meu Deus, por que não faz o nosso grátis? É isso. E aí com esse é o jeito de fazer interativo. Esse é o jeito de fazer interativo. A gente tá procurando a prova. Aí eu comecei a fazer o que era assim que mudou nisso. O que era assim? Pera, era assim mesmo, é que eu fiz a primeira fazer melhor? Não, é assim mesmo. A gente tinha que escrever as coisas. E aí, vamos escrever uma vez. E aí, eu fiz três Thank you. 
to uh, one, and then the last one we can choose from just one way, because this will be the remaining number. So this V multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1, or in a general case N multiplied by N minus 1, multiplied by A minus 2, and so on and so on. So this is the N factorial one. Okay? Uh, Sometimes the set of all of the permutations is denoted as S and then the set. Or in some cases this is just S4, but this is not very important. So we actually choose S here because of that. Okay? This is related to the group theory, if you are interested in that. Uh, it is very interesting, but I don't want to go into much detail. Uh, okay, another question. Uh, can we, okay, at the very beginning we have said that we have transpositions or swaps. Can we say that we can, uh, okay, and we said that every permutation can be uh, decomposed into some set of swaps. Now the question is, can we do it in one way or many ways? Okay, so what I'm saying, we start from some permutation, and then we can say that this should be a composition of some swaps. So, for example, the first swap can be, we start from the identity, and more things here. Then we swap 3 with 2, so this is one swap, and then we are swapping 5 with 4, so this is the other swap. So now I'm saying that this permutation, P, is basically uh, some alpha composed with beta, when both of these are some transpositions. Transpositions. Or swaps. So now I'm asking, is it always possible to decompose the permutation into unique set of swaps, the one way of the decomposition to this permutation. Yes, I, I can take some uh, random swaps. So, for example, I can take the transposition that will just swap. Uh, maybe just take this one. So this will be alpha and this is beta, I can take alpha and I can add it, uh, compose it once, uh, two times here. And uh, composing the same transposition doesn't have an effect. So it is not unique in any way. But now the other question, is the minimal number of transpositions also unique or not? The answer is no, but I will give this as an exercise. So like to solve this exercise, we need to come up with the permutation when the minimal number of transposition that we can decompose this permutation to uh, is something, and we need to find two different ways to achieve this goal. Does the order matter? Uh, that's a good question, and I don't want to answer this question. <laughs> Maybe let's think yes. about it for, for a moment. That, that's the other matter. Yes. Can someone give a quick example what it matters? Uh, this one, two, one, two, and two, three. If you change the order, you change. Uh, yes, you have to say it again. This one, two, then two, three. One, uh, alpha. One, two, three. And one, three. So we have two, one, four. And a different way, one. So this is. Uh, Okay. I promise to make a bigger font, so I will try to do it here again. One, two, three, four. And then I'm swapping one and two. I have two, one, three, four. And then swapping one and three, I have two, three, one, four. And if I do it the other way, so first I'm swapping one and three, I have three, two, one, four. And then I'm swapping one and two. I have three, one, two, four. So you can see that the other does matter in this case. Okay, that was a little bit of example. 
Okay, yeah, so to, I will leave this as an open question, but you know that the answer is no, it is not unique as well. Uh, okay, so this is everything that I wanted to repeat or my, maybe say new things but about old stuff. Now we'll talk about new stuff. So we will start by introducing something called inversion. So an inversion in a permutation is a set of indices, so uh, i and j, such that i is smaller than j, and a i, maybe p i, is greater than p j. Okay? So inversion is some pair of elements that are not in the correct order. So the element that is earlier in the permutation is greater than the element that is later in the permutation. So in this example, one such inversion is 5 and 4, because 5 is greater and it's earlier than 4. Another example is 4, 2, or maybe 3 and 2. Okay? Quick question once again, how many inversions can we have in a permutation? <laughs> n minus 1 factorial. So that is upper the bound, maybe. And lower bound? Lower bound is 0. And upper bound, any other guesses? Something like this. So, okay, how we can achieve lower bound? That's this one with the easier of course. That's identity. How we can achieve upper bound? The reverse identity. So, in this case, we have this is one inversion, this is one inversion, this is one inversion, so we have three. This is three multiplied by two divided by two, this is three. Looks good for me. Uh, in general case, In general case, this element will generate inversion with every element on the right side. So we'll have n minus 2, no, minus 1, yes. Generated by this one. Then this will generate inversion with every single element on the right side. So it will be n minus 2, plus 1, plus 0. So we'll have n minus 1 multiplied by n, divided by 2. So that's good. Okay. Uh, so now we are giving a we are given a permutation, and we want to know how many inversions we have in this permutation. How we can do that? Say uh, again, I'm sorry. Sure. So the easiest way. Is just n squared. So we are having two loops. Uh, we can even start from i plus 1 to n. And then if ai is greater than a j, then inversion plus plus. Okay? But it is slightly brute force, I would say. <laughs> can we do better than that? But like, is it clear that we can do that in uh, quadratic time? Yes, so this is one way to solve it. The second way, we want to have some kind of segment tree, like country, family tree, or something like that. And then what we are doing, we are going to this uh, permutation. So let's say that this will be my some kind of segment tree. And then what I want to do, I want to know that I already have this element. Okay, I will start by maybe here. So I already know that I had 1, I had 3, and I had 4. And then I want to know how many inversions 4 can generate. 
So what I need to do, I need to check how many elements greater than false I already seen or well on the left side of my uh, you know, pointer. So what I need to do, I need to know how many numbers were greater than false. So I will keep this in some kind of as I said, segment three. The only operations I need, I need to add something to the point. So add to point. And the other operation is query how many greater than x. Okay? So my query is basically asking how many numbers are greater than the current number. So I know that 4 will generate one inversion with 5. And then I'm adding 4 here. And then I'm asking how many inversions will 2 generate. So I'm asking how many numbers are greater than 2. So I add 3 to the answer, because I will have inversion with 3, 4, 5. And then add 2 at the end. Okay? So let me try to simulate it from the very beginning, because I wanted to start from the middle to so explain how it works, but now let's start once again. So I have 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm starting with one. I'm asking how many numbers I've already considered that are greater than one. The answer is zero. So I'm out, like I'm keeping the counter to zero, and then I'm adding one to this point. So I have one here. Then I'm doing the same with three. So first I'm asking how many numbers I already considered that are greater than three. The answer is zero. But then I'm adding three, one, two, three. Uh, I did the same thing with 5, nothing changed here, and then I'm finally having some uh, things here. So I'm asking the same thing for 4, so how many numbers are greater than 4 that I already considered? The answer is 1, so I'm adding 1 to the level. Uh, and then I'm adding 4, and then I do the same with 2, so I'm adding this 3, and then I'm adding this one here. Okay? So the answer is 4. For this presentation, I have 4 inversions. So the, one of the main is this one. Okay? What is the complexity of this solution? And again, because I need to keep this tree and I need to perform opera operations on it, and each operation is localized in time. Okay? Now, uh, one thing that we need to consider, I don't really care if it is a permutation. I can, the, I can basically say that inversion is something in just some array, without it being a permutation, I can have like uh, several elements of the same, uh, like several times the same number, or I, have some, I can have some missing numbers, this method will still work. Okay? So I can ask about inversions in any array of any kind. Uh, there's another way to do it. Okay, I'll just call it. You can do it with methods. And I don't want to go into details because it's not something that you do very often. But what you can do is basically, when you do the math sort, you divide the two things into, like, you divide an array into two super sub arrays, and then you somehow sort them together. So now the question is, how many inventions are you doing after sorting this part and this part? So the, the other, maybe I'll give an example. Uh, So what I'm doing in my sort, I divide this into two, and I divide this into two sub-arrays, and then I sort, like, I sort them here, because they are easy to sort because this is just one element, but then I merge these two sub-arrays into one. So then I start and saying that three will be lower than four, and here I'm saying that one will be lower than two. So what is happening, I want to know how many times I needed to cross through this barrier? Because this is an inversion, what I'm currently having here. So if I need to swap something to this barrier, that means that I will have at least, like, I will have some number of inversions here. 
So here I'm adding plus one inversion. But then I need to do the same here. So I need to match these two things put together. So I'm taking one from the right side. So that means I need to go through the variable. So I need to know that I will have at least one permutation, uh, one inversion here. Uh, then I need to go do the same with two. So I'm adding just one as well. And then I have three and four. So the thing is that it's not always one because I need to consider how many elements I need to, I needed to pass to this variable. So it's, it's kind of tricky. I need to know like how many elements I already considered or something like that. But there's a way to do it, and it's like not very like it needed some time to basically go through all. Maybe I should. Okay, I don't, we don't have time to go through it. So I'll just say there's a way to do it through a method. If you want more details and you are not sure how to do it, just you reach out to me and then we can talk in more details how we can do it. But there's a way to do it. And the complexity is same as the Fenwick tree, so it's like n of n. Uh, so this is also n of n. Any questions? Okay. So why inversions are important? Uh, uh, do you want to start with problem or with some other definition? There are two ways to do it. Okay, let's do the problem. Uh, called formation. So in this problem, uh, we are given some array, so let's simplify some stuff, but let's say we have just one array. It doesn't have to be permutation, but for the sake of this problem, let's call it, let's say that it is just permutation because it's not very important. And uh, we are allowed, okay, query this. We are swapping two elements of this uh, permutation. So, for example, I will swap uh, 5 with 6. So then I will have 3, 6, 4, 2, 5, 1. And then I want to output out number of inversions in this permutation. Okay? So I'm doing this swap, I'm counting the number of inversions, and then I'm returning to the original permutation. So this is what if I'm not having continuous operations. So, but I can take another query that is swapping 3 with 2. So I will have 2, 5, 4, 3, 6, 1. And then I'm asking for, for the number of inversions in this permutation. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Uh, I'll give you a minute to think about it, and then we'll talk about some ideas. It is not that simple as the previous one. I'm just saying this in advance. So there will be a bunch of steps we need to do to finish this problem. No, I said like that independent, so this is like oh, okay. I'm changing the things, then I'm going back to the original one, I'm changing to other things, and then to the original one and so on. Okay. 
Okay, I think one minute has passed. So there was a very important question that someone asked. Can you answer these queries on, offline? And the answer is yes. And it is quite important for this problem. But there's a way to do it online as well that maybe we'll talk about. But you should focus, like, it's a very good hint. You should focus on answering these queries offline. Okay, any thoughts, ideas? Okay, uh, the idea was uh, uh, persistent segmenting. Okay, it can work, but I wouldn't try to implement it. So that's, that's my idea. I guess it can be any way to do it. Uh, you can calculate the elements using the pairing screen, and when you reach an element, you calculate how many elements you should have if it's been sorted. Yes, I think. Okay, I'll try to iterate it again, and maybe also do something. Uh, let's take this permutation and let's try to put it in some graph, but not a graph in the uh, nodes and edges, but a graph like just to uh, plot them in some way. So at the first position, I have three. At the second position, I have five. At the Third position I have four, at the fourth position I have two, at the fifth position I have six, at the sixth position I have one. Okay, so in this visualization, I can also easily say what is an inversion. What is an inversion? <laughs> it is just a line going like this. So it has to go from the, from the left side up to the, the right side down. Okay, so this is not an inversion, but for example, this is an inversion as well. And this is an inversion as well. Okay? So now the question is, what happens if I swap two uh, elements in this permutation? I need a different color again. So let's say I will swap this element, so the second one, with the fourth one. So what is happening? This goes here, and this goes here. So now, the first question. Can we, like, what inversions can, like, what, what happens with the inversions? Like, what can change with inversions? Only the elements in between go down to the top. Uh, why is that? Because, uh, the relative position between elements that are outside of the segment uh, remain the same with elements within the segment. But if, if an element is to the left of both elements that you, that you swap, it will stay on the left. And if it's on the right of the two elements that you swap, uh, they will stay on the right. So, yeah. it doesn't matter. so we are talking that anything outside of this box probably remains the same. Like all of the inventions remain the same. Why is that? We can look at this element. It had inversion with this element here. But now in our new world, it is still on the right side, of, uh, like this element is still on the right side, and it's still lower. So nothing changed, like this still remains here. And similarly, for example, when we had this one, this uh, inversion, the only thing that changed this, there is an inversion, but with this element. So nothing changed on this side. Uh, so that is one thing. So we are saying outside of this box, we are relatively safe. 
But what happens in the thoughts? There's one element in this particular case, but so let's see what happens. So we had two permutations. We had this permutation and we had this permutation, uh, inversion of permutation. We had two inversions, these two inversions. But what happens now? We don't have inversion here because this is fine, and we don't have inversion here, so this is fine. Okay? So that is something that we need to care about. Uh, in particular, what, what exactly can happen in this box? So, I have this box, and I can have some elements inside. Uh, so, the, the red will be original, and the black will be new. So, this was the original one. So, first of all, do we need to worry about the stuff under or above this box? No. We search now, but I will just say it again. If something is here, then we have inversion here, but now we have inversion here, so everything still the same. And similarly, if something was above this box, I have inversion here, but now I have inversion here, so I think it's safe. But what is happening here, like I can have several elements here, and you can see that all of the elements here have inversion with the right element. So we have these things here. And now they don't. So the number of inversions change in what way? The amount of elements, uh, it changes by the amount of elements that is inside the box. Decreases by the number of forms. And I forgot that I need to say people form. The number of elements in the box. Okay, so this is one way because we can swap something that already has an invention to not have an invention. So another thing that's changed is I'm having this plus one. Uh, plus or minus? Minus one. Because Previously, I had this invention, and now I don't have it. So I also like uh, minus one existing inversion. Okay, what happens if I do it the other way? So now I start from something that didn't have an inversion, and then I create a new inversion. So once again, we said that something happens outside of this box, but for the elements inside of this box, what changes? Uh, you create inversion. Yeah. So now I here I decrease the number of inversion. Here I'll be increasing the number of inversion because in the original one, in the last one, this wasn't an inversion. This wasn't an inversion. This wasn't an inversion. Everything was fine. But now in the black box. I have inversion here, I have inversion here, I have inversion here. Uh, sure. So do I need to count the number of inversions in the other points? That's a good question, and the answer is... So the inversion between these points, or between any other points here, stays the same. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, here. Because, like, okay, if I create a new version that this is one inversion, but I also create a version with this new one. So, yeah, 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 yeah. So, this is two times, uh, two multiplied by the number of elements, minus one. So, let's go, okay. Number of elements will be k. So, in this case, if I decrease the number of conversion, I decrease it by 2k plus 1, minus this. And if I add new inversions, I'm adding 2k plus 1 new inversions. Okay? So, the only problem that remains is basically how we can calculate the number of elements in the box. And this is why I said we should do it probably offline. 
Because what we can do, we can mark all, all the elements that are important. So for example, I will have like this is one of the invest uh, one of the swap I'm doing. So I'm marking that I want to know how many elements are here, I want to know how many elements are here, I want to know how many elements are here and here. And from these three values, I can calculate how many elements are in this box. So inclusion, inclusion principle, or something like that. Okay? And now the question remains, how can I calculate how many elements are in this box? So the box that starts in the lower left corner. Yes, yeah, some segments. I'm basically going through that way. I'm adding the points to the... I'm having two actions. Either I have uh, some elements, so I'm adding this to some set family tree, like some, I'm sweeping it on the, uh, that way, so I'm adding it here. And then if I have a query action, so this is query, then basically counting how many elements I have on this, uh, to this particular point. And this will be, this will answer how many points I have in this box. Okay? So let's start, uh, let's repeat everything what we said. Uh, we said that we only care about the number of inversions that are generated by some set of points, and it is bounded by some box, where the edges are basically like this. And then we have two options. Either we are generating the inversions, if we took something that didn't have an inversion, but now it will have, so this is the same, I saw it, or we already have inversions, and we are getting rid of it. And we, then we are decreasing the number of inversions by this inversion and two times the number of all of the points that are in this box. So the only question that remains is how many numbers are in this box? And to answer this, we basically do uh, offline queries by having the four bounding boxes and then calculating what will be the number of points in this box by taking all of this this big one, removing these parts, and then adding this part as well, uh, again. So it will be this box minus this box minus this box, plus added the small box. Okay? And then we are saying we can do it offline in uh, n log n time, by basically sweeping some family tree from left to right. Uh, and then we can calculate this in uh, O of one time. So that's very easy. Uh, questions about the solution? That's right, this is slightly tricky. You need it like some steps, but in general it's like not that difficult. And so like quite I find it interesting to like see how we how the number of inversions change changes with this one. Um, there is option to do it uh, online, so we don't have to do this thing. There's probably a way to do it with persistent segment D, I think, but I'm not fairly sure. But there's a structure called uh, wavelet C, and there's a way to do it with wavelet C online, because it's basically allow us to do some of these swaps slightly easier. Uh, so if you want, this is the structure. It is very niche. And I don't know of any application of this data structure that cannot be found in some other, other way. But it can be done with this stuff and with this as well. Uh, okay. How much time do we have left? We have 20 minutes, so it's not there, but let me try to... Okay, let me try to add two more things to discuss. First one is called parity. So parity is the parity of the number of inversions of the permutation. Okay, so we are giving a presentation, uh, let's say identity, which 
counts the number of inversions. This, in this case, we have zero inversions. So then we are saying that this permutation is even, because the number of inversions is even. And similarly, if you have only one inversion, then we say that the permutation is off. Now we are saying that because of this, generally, if we add a, a transposition to that uh, permutation, then the parity always changes. Why is that? Because we said that the number of uh, inversions change, changes by something that is 2 multiplied by something, so this is always even, plus or minus 1. Okay? So the parity changes exactly by plus or to minus 1, so if we are adding a new transposition, then we are changing the parity of the uh, permutation. Okay? So theorem or lemma or whatever, Swapping two elements changes parity. And in general, we can even think about it in a different way. So we have we know that we can divide permutation into some cycles. So can we say something about the parity of just the cycle? So for example, if you have one cycle. Do we know what is the parity of this permutation without thinking that much? So this is from 1 to 5, and that's it. Uh, I hear odd, 5 plus. I, you have to speak louder. Yes, more or less. So what we are saying is that we can start from identity and we said that we can match two cycles to, uh, together, but basically swapping them. So what is happening here is that I'm having this and then I can add new elements and I will have this and so on and so on. And with each step, I'm changing the parity because of something I said here. So adding to swap is changing the parity. So I started with even, then I have odd, then I have even, then I have odd, and I think I will finish at even. You can check, that to be sure. So this permutation is 2, 3, 4, 5, 1. So it has one, two, three, four inversions. Okay? So, cycle of odd length is to create even uh, permutation, and vice versa, cycle of odd length, uh, of even length, create odd uh, permutation. Okay? And you can do it even more. So, we can say that if we have a bunch of cycles, so we can have this, this and this, then we know that this is uh, odd, this is also odd, and this is even, and then you can compose these, all of these cycles together. So you have odd multiplied by odd multiplied by even, so it will be even in the end. Okay? So we can know the parity of the permutation just by looking at the cycle. Question. Okay, why is this important? Maybe that should be a question. Uh, Uh, if you do a composition of two odd permutations, does it always create even? Yes. Uh, I don't want to give the details, but yes. <laughs> like you can think, like as an exercise, think what will happen if I try to compose two odd permutations with each other. What will happen if I try to compose odd and even? That's okay. Like that's fairly easy to behave uh, how it should behave, but. 
I don't want to go into this because we don't have time, I'm really sorry. Uh, and we actually don't have time for the solos, I'll just say the problem, and then maybe tomorrow we will talk about the solution for this problem. So the problem is called 15. And I don't know if you ever saw, but there's a puzzle that has a board 4x4, four four, and there are uh, some boxes in some of the cells. So it looks like this. And the move that is allowed is taking any of the elements that is neighboring an empty box, there's always one empty box, and we can move it to the empty box. So if I just can move 12 here, then we can move 11 here, then we can move 7 here, and so on and so on. So the problem is, you are given some initial position of this puzzle, and you want to answer, is it possible to get to the final position? When the final position is everything is sorted, and the empty box is on the right bottom side, the right bottom side is here. Okay? So this is the problem. We won't have time today to talk about the solution, because I'm really sorry that it took so long uh, at the beginning of the lecture. But I will give you to think about it for a minute. It is very, like, I talk about parities of permutations in some way, like, it is a permutation, and parity is important, so we need to think about invariance of some way to say, like, what we cannot change in this uh, puzzle by, uh, by performing the moves that I described. Okay? Uh, I can give you a clue. Half of the initial position is possible, and half of the initial position uh, is not possible to finish. Okay? Any questions about the problem? Yes? Yeah. It has to be neighbor in the empty box. And that's the only condition, that's whatever. And don't think about uh, the minimal number of the steps you need to do, because the solar is empty complete and it has been proven. So don't worry about that. Uh, okay, so this is like some homework and we'll probably talk about this tomorrow in the moment. The last thing I want to talk about, uh, and we don't have that much time, so I'll try to do as quick as possible, and I'll also, also give you a problem. This is a theorem. One guy is at those, and the other guy is Shankarets, I think, I thought. The first is Hungarian that I know. I think the other one is also Hungarian, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, does anyone know about this theorem? Who knows about this theorem? Okay, not many. That's surprising. Okay, so the theorem is... Uh, Given a permutation, given a permutation of Len M, there exists. A monotone subsequence of when any guesses from people that don't don't know? Square root of n. Yes. So what we are saying here that we are giving any permutation, maybe I'll just add an asterisk. It doesn't have to be permutation, really. Uh, but we are giving a permutation, and either the longest increasing subsequence or the longest decreasing subsequence will have to learn at least square root of n. So we are saying that if we have, uh, for example, uh, uh, identity permutation, that we know that the lo uh, longest increasing subsequence will have to learn n. But we cannot have a permutation that doesn't have any of them, like increasing or decreasing subsequence shorter than square root of n. Okay? That's the theorem. Uh, a sketch of the proof of this theorem 
Hmm. Okay, I'll give you some hints how to prove this theorem. Maybe if you will have some time tomorrow, I will have a complete proof. But in general, we are asking, uh, like for every element, we want to know what is the longest increasing subsequence, so let's call it uh, longest increasing subsequence in this position, and what is the longest decreasing subsequence in this position. And we do this for the each element, so this will be something like this. And then we have these pairs. We have n pairs, uh, list i and LDS i. And then we are looking into the uh, how's it called? Uh, I lost the word for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, Yeah, but uh, I need to be one second. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> uh, we use pigeon fold principle. I don't know why I couldn't figure out the oh. pigeon. So we use the pigeon fold principle to say that we cannot have uh, more than uh, square root of n numbers. And then you're saying that there will really exist something, like, okay, if you look at these numbers, they basically form an array. Like, this is less, and this is LDS, and we need to somehow cover this, and they cannot be equal. So, for example, we are covering this way, so we know that one of these numbers, that is, for example, here, has to be greater or equal to the square root of n. Okay, so it's like very hand wavy, but I think you can see like where this proof is going. Okay, uh, this theorem is very important because if you don't know it, then you are lost in like so many problems. Uh, one problem that I want to talk briefly about is, I really like this problem, so I will probably, we'll also talk about the solution for it, but I will just mention it right now. Uh, uh, who knows the traveling salesman problem? TSP. Okay, a lot. So, in this problem, we want to know what is the shortest path, or in this problem, we'll talk about the shortest cycle that spans some number of. Like, we want to find the shortest path that goes to every point in this path, something like that. Okay. So now we are given a problem, but we are given a lot of points, but we are allowed to choose 500 points, I think it was even like 300,000, we are allowed to choose 500 points, for, and for these points we want to solve the uh, traveling salesman problem. Okay? So we are giving some number of points, we are allowed to choose some of these points, like you can choose whatever you want, and then you have to prove that you can solve the TSP for this set of points that we have chosen. Okay? The problem is called parade, and it is probably one of my famous problems in some 2019 or something like that. Uh, yeah. The distances are in the plane? Yeah, distances are like equilibrium. I think that's the word for that. So the distance between these two points is x b minus x a squared plus y b minus y a squared and square root of that. Okay. So, you can imagine that we want to use this theorem in a way. There is a reason why n is so large and k is not so large. But I will give you, like, this, this is an important stuff you need to do to solve the problem, but there are still some stuff you need to do after that. So, leave this with you. Uh, so, we have two problems. We have parade, that is the problem for the Edo second theorem. 
And the other problem is uh, also the day 15, which is here. Uh, and I think that that is everything for today. Uh, please make sure that you register on copies. We will have the problem here. I'm still okay. I I want to ask. I want to make an experiment, and I want to make the first problem, uh, the first contest individual contest. So everyone is writing their contest separately. Uh, so who is strongly against this? Please raise your hand. Who likes this idea? Please raise your hand. Okay. So I will probably make this experiment, but this is this will be once and only time on this camp. Okay, this will be the only contest that is individual. All the rest will be team contest. But I I want to see what will happen. So I might change my mind in an hour. You can try to convince me otherwise, but we'll see. Uh, okay, that's everything for today. If you need something for me, you know how to find it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.